few weeks ago in Habakkuk, we came to that passage, the righteous shall live by his faith. Well, the Apostle Paul latches hold of that passage and makes it something of a foundation for this letter that he writes to the Christians at Rome. And so having come to the end of the pre-exilic prophets and, uh, and a long stretch of dwelling in those scriptures uh, written, uh, predated to our Savior's birth, Romans seems like an excellent place for us to go for our next series of sermons. So to Romans we turn today and hopefully again and again for many months to come as the Lord gives them to us. By way of background, we don't know exactly when or how the church was planted in Rome. Likely it was the spread of the faith westward from that great Pentecost event, uh, the great missionary event following our Lord's ascension into heaven as recorded in the book of Acts. But at any rate, Paul writes them this most exquisite letter, Uh, what centuries later Martin Luther would call the chief part of the New Testament and the very, that is, the perfect gospel. Let's pray. Father, we, we ask that you will open our hearts to the gospel. We open them to you gladly. Send your spirit to apply your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 1 of Romans, we'll read the first four verses. Paul, a servant of of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. At just 31 years of age, Augustine, the church father as we know him, already held a prestigious position as a professor in the great court of, uh, in Milan. He had respect, he had a promising future, But he was miserable. The philosophies he had pursued to that point in his life were collapsing. And in keeping with those empty philosophies, he had descended into all kinds of licentiousness, sensual pleasures. According to his own account, he had given himself to drunkenness and to sexual immorality. By the time the year 386 dawned, Augustine had become attracted to the truths of Christianity, but still he was suffering in bondage to his sensual and sexual drives and pleasures. Internally torn, he went out behind his house and into the garden where he could sit on the grass under a tree And as he sat there, he became very agitated, began to pull his hair out, as a matter of fact, when he heard suddenly the voice of a child. Was it a game? If so, he had never heard it before. Tolalege! Tolalege! The child cried. Take up and read. And he did. He opened to the book of Romans, and the gospel of God took hold of Augustine's heart. Nothing was ever the same for him or for us. Dear flock, this is the gospel of God. Now, you know that the letter uh, to the Romans is known for its gravitas, its weightiness, its chock full of solid theology, but that doesn't make it dusty and dry. Paul, the author of this letter, is a theologian par excellence, Uh, but he is a theologian whose blood runs warm and lively from a pulsating heart. We hear its beat right from the starting gate in the sentences we've just 
read. Theology, true theology studied rightly, inexorably leads to doxology. Doctrine leads to devotion. Study leads to praise. As C.S. Lewis puts it about those who willingly take up theological study with earnestness and vigor, quote, the heart sings unbidden while they are working through a tough piece of theology with a pipe in their teeth and a pencil in their hand. I'm trying to imagine you all with a pipe clenched between your teeth right now and a pencil in your hand. And I guess the pipe and the pencil, well, the pipe anyway may be an optional accessory, but you get the point. Now, for Paul, theology begins with the gospel. In fact, he uses that word four times in just the first several verses of this letter. In verse 1, 9, 15, 16. But what exactly is the gospel? I mean, just this morning, Deacon Shields was just praying about the gospel. What are, what are we talking about? Well, gospel, the word gospel literally means good news. That's what the gospel means. When you say gospel, you're saying good news. So when we say that, for example, that the go- good news must be proclaimed, the gospel must be proclaimed, we're saying proclaim this news. But do we grasp, brothers and sisters, what is so good about this good news? I mean, do you and I, like Paul, revel in this good news? Does it, does it move us to rejoicing, to living it out? Do we burn to tell others the good news. You know, these days, the, the great goodness of the good news is, is becoming clearer by contrast. I mean, look at the religions of the world. What do you see? One form or another, all of them save one, are proclaiming a pretty similar message, aren't they? Do these things, right? Be this way. Obey these rules. Follow these regulations. And things will be well with you. In fact, boil down all of the world's religions. Go ahead and survey all the world's religions, save one, of course, and that is what you get with some slight variations. You get works for salvation. You get earned happiness. You get merited peace. You get what you deserve. So called. You get reconciliation with God based not on what He does for you, but on what you must do for Him. Think about the the message of one of today's most prominent religions to women. In particular, wear these sort of clothes from head to toe. Say these prayers at these times of the day. Follow this many steps behind your husband. Follow these rules and God will be pleased with you. And oh, by the way, more good news If you do these things well, we will not maim, beat, burn, or kill you. Some good news, right? There's a saying today that good news is no news. The no religion religion has been rising in popularity at the same time these days, expressed so poignantly in the oft-heard words of John Lennon, that uh, blare over the speakers of Times Square every New Year's Day. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us, only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. That, in his thought, would be good news. But it's not, is it? It's the very opposite. Living for today, nothingness to follow, that's not good news. That's a recipe for despair. That's emptiness. That's meaninglessness. Here's the good news. 
God. It is the gospel. Paul calls it the gospel of God. John Piper coined the phrase, God is the gospel. And that is certainly true. The gospel is good news about God. On the other hand, the gospel, the truly good news, also comes from the one true triune God, doesn't it? For you young uh, linguistic scholars here, in that last sentence you're hearing me dancing a little bit uh, with the debate over how to translate the Greek here, the Greek genitive case. The choice is being between the objective genitive and the subjective genitive. In other words, should we translate this as this is God's gospel or should we translate it as the gospel about God? Well, after having, doing, having done some study on uh, the passage, I've come to the conclusion that the answer is yes. It is both. It is truly God's gospel and it is the gospel about God. Here's the point. The good news, the gospel is captured in one three-letter word. G-O-D. Listen, when Paul looked on that man at, at, at Lystra, remember that man crippled from birth, he had never walked, and then called out to him, stand up straight on your feet, and the man leaped up and walked. Remember what the people yelled? The gods have Come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes. And they brought oxen and garland and they sacrificed to them. What did Paul say? He says, stop. We bring you good news. Literally, we bring you the gospel. And then where does he begin? Turn from these worthless things to the living God. He says to them, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all things that are in them, as you've just confessed this morning. Or remember Paul in the Areopagus in Athens. Where does he begin with those philosophers? Where does he start? I see you, your altar inscribed to the unknown God. Well, him I proclaim to you, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth. John Piper, of course, is exactly right. God is the gospel. The ruler of heaven and earth who made them and who controls them, whom we confess in this house, in whom we believe, he is the foundation stone in the structure of the Christian gospel. So Paul begins with the Romans this way, and with us today, the gospel of God. Reminds me of Francis Schaeffer's foundational phrase, you know, the God who is there. He is real. He has created us and all things, and that is where the gospel, the good news, truly begins. Not by imagining there's no heavens and no religion, too, but by realizing that behind everything we see and behind everything we don't see, there is God. And therefore, there is meaning. But there's more than that. There must be more. The, you know, the gospel of God speaks, yes, of his existence, but not only that, not only his reality, there has to be more because we know that, that merely that uh, to know merely that God exists immediately plunges us into a deep dilemma. You see, we've offended Him. We, we've, we've broken God's law. By our sins, we have separated ourselves from God, haven't we? We've created an unbridgeable gulf between ourselves and our Creator. That is why it's not simply enough to say, God... And leave it at that. We can't find him. We grope about in the darkness, blinded by sin. We can't get to him, can we, on our own? Who is the subject of the gospel? Well, we've already answered that question. It's God. But what about God? What's so good about the good news of God, particularly 
if because of our sin we're groping around in the darkness. We can't find him. Well, that's where the good news gets even gooder, even uh, better, I guess I should say. Here is the good, good news. God has sent his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, into the world. The gospel of God is the gospel of Christ. We may even put it this way. The gospel, if the gospel is God, then Christianity is Christ. John Stott wrote in his little book, The Basic Christianity, quote, the person and work of Christ are the rock upon which the Christian religion is built. If he is not who he said he was, and if he did not do what he said he came to do, the foundation is undermined and the whole superstructure will collapse. Take Christ from Christianity and you disembowel it. There is practically nothing left. Christ is the center of Christianity. All else is circumference. End quote. Now Paul, the author of this letter, has sometimes been called the father or the founder of Christianity. But of course that's not true. Christ is the founder of Christianity. Others have said that, uh, that Christianity amounts to a list of doctrines and dusty creeds. And that is not true. Christianity, true Christianity, is not just a set of convictions or of propositions, is it? You know this. True Christianity is a relationship. It's a relationship with a person. That person is Christ. But to have a relationship with someone, what's necessary? If you have a relationship with anybody, what, what, what has to happen? You have to get to know them, right? Know about them and get to know them. And the same is true with Jesus. So that's what Paul is after right from the, the get-go here. Paul tells us three things about him, at least three, but we'll, we'll consider just three. First, in verse 3, he calls Jesus God's Son. Now remember back in Matthew chapter 16, that discussion between Jesus and his disciples, standing in the region of Caesarea Philippi there at the foot of, of Mount Hermon, Jesus turns to his disciples and asks an interesting question. Remember what that question is at Caesarea Philippi? Kind of a watershed in, in the Lord's ministry with them. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? They look at each other. <laughs> it's an interesting moment to imagine, isn't it? Having put that question right to them. Who do people say? Well, one of them, well, um, I've heard people say that you're John the Baptist. And I imagine another one saying, yeah, but you know what? We're back there in Gennesaret. Someone said that it must be Elijah. Another says, well, Jeremiah is what I heard him saying the other day. Now Jesus turns the question on them. But who do you say that I am? I want an important question needed answering by the disciples. Whose voice was heard? Who do you anticipate? You know the 12. Whose voice is next? <laughs> yeah, right, Peter, exactly right. Peter, sure enough, chimes in. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, what's the point of that whole exercise? Well, the point was, as great as those men Elijah and Jeremiah and John the Baptist were, none of them even entered the same class with Jesus. Why? Because Jesus alone is the Son of the living God. What it meant was that Jesus was more than, than mere man. He is God, the divine Messiah. John Murray, in his commentary, ably demonstrates that when Paul speaks of Jesus as the Son, that what Paul has specifically in mind, what he's referring to is Jesus' eternal relationship 
with the Father that precedes, that supersedes his, his incarnation, his being made flesh. Calls up other passages, Murray does, from Paul's writing, like God did not spare his own son, or God sent his own son to demonstrate that what Paul has in mind here is the eternal relationship between the Father and the Son in the Trinity. In other words, to quote John Murray, Jesus has no lower station than that of equality with the Father. So Jesus is God. Second thing that Paul says about Christ is that he is man, genuinely man. He is flesh and blood, and to prove the point further, he even calls up his genealogy. He names Jesus' most famous ancestor. You know who that is, right? David. Jesus is a real man, descended from David, according to the flesh. A real human being. He has flesh. During his days with them, the disciples touched him. We recall just recently John putting his head upon Jesus' breast. He ate, he walked with his disciples, he slept, he got up in the morning, he washed his face, everything. So he was and is God and he was and still is today, by the way, in heaven right now. He is fully man as well. His mother and his foster father, Joseph, had relatives, had ancestors who were really genuinely Jesus' ancestors as well. You remember even the angel understood this. He said to the shepherds on that first Christmas night, remember he says, fear not for I bring you what? Good news, gospel, right? Of great joy that shall be for all the people for unto you is materialized. Unto you is beamed down. No, no, none of that. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Jesus is God. Jesus is man. God's Son becomes man. Now this makes Jesus the most unique person, doesn't it? Ever to walk the face of the earth. But there is more. He is God and he is man. And third, Paul says about Christ, he is resurrected from the dead. Verse 4, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. It's not that Jesus lived a nice life and you know, died a heroic death and then that was the end of the story. If that were the end of the story, then... Uh, Paul tells us in another of his letters where we would stand, doesn't he? Remember in Corinthians, we would be hopeless, wouldn't we? All in vain. There'd be nothing to talk about. There'd be no reason to be in this place here this morning, would there? But if Jesus rose from the dead, and he did, why then there is something remarkable. And something fully unique, something marvelous, something life-changing, allegiance-demanding about this person, Jesus. And of course, there is. And that fact is guaranteed forever by the resurrection, by his having burst forth from that tomb. Robert Ingersoll, the famous agnostic, he was no friend to Christianity. But he sure understood this much. Quote, Christianity cannot live in peace with any other form of faith. If that religion be true, there is but one Savior. One inspired book and one little narrow path that leads to heaven. And Ingersoll was exactly right. 
And of course, unless he repented of his agnosticism during his life, he has the rest of eternity to regret just how right he was. You see the power of this letter to the Romans now, don't you? From the very opening words, from the very first verses, all is demanded of you. Your all, your everything, your full, unfettered, unmitigated, unalloyed allegiance to him. Paul is not going slowly to warm up to his point, isn't he? He's not in the, uh, what do they call it in baseball when you're, you're pra practicing your swings, the bullpen, whatever, or pitches, whatever. Paul is going straight to the point. He is getting straight to it. This is the gospel of Christ, the God-man attested to you by his resurrection from the dead. And now that you know now that you have heard it, you must either follow him with all your heart or reject him completely. Those are the only options left to you this morning. The only option that Jesus leaves open to no one is neutrality. For all, take him or leave him, as you will. But that's who he is, and that's what he demands. And for all who receive him, this is the good news. This is the gospel indeed, and it makes all the difference. It certainly made all the difference to these Christians who first received this letter. You know, if they did not already, they would soon know, wouldn't they, the bitterness of persecution. A crescendo of suffering came for these Christians under the emperor Nero in Rome, the, the very destination of this letter. But the gospel, this gospel of God and of his Christ, would sustain and would carry them through the deepest darkness. This good news, even in the midst of the persecution, and the pain. You notice perhaps the, uh, the interest these days in the history of the uh, Second World War. Those who live to see it are becoming fewer and fewer these days. I got to bury a veteran a few um, weeks ago, a Navy veteran, and uh, after the funeral we remarked to each other how this is becoming more and more uh, rare thing. But uh, I want to um, imagine something with you from back during the world, the Second World War. I, would you imagine with me for a moment American prisoners, and we prayed this morning, didn't we, about American prisoners of war. Um, imagine American prisoners emaciated and sick and dying daily in one of those terrible Nazi prison camps through the barbed wire and see them somber and, and uh, suffering, even as the enemy, warmly dressed and, and well-fed, makes their way around the outside. And then just imagine with me that one day a shortwave radio is smuggled into that camp. And each night in the darkness, they gather around that radio, they huddle around that radio and turn it in a, ever so quietly, and they, and they listen and they receive news. They follow the progress of the war, and, and then one day the, the captors notice something very strange, though nothing has changed as far as they're concerned. They see the prisoners inside the camp actually smiling, smiling even back at them. In fact, they're actually kind to their tormentors. They see these prisoners, though thin and undernourished, some even dying, gleefully shaking hands with one another in joy. What has happened? What has made the difference? News. Good news. The enemy they know has been effectively defeated. 
Liberation is as is, is good as theirs. It's simply a matter of time until their captors will know it fully too. You see the difference that news makes. Freedom is theirs, and it's just, it's just a matter of a few miles until their liberators arrive and make it fully theirs. For Christians, you have the news, you have the good news. Our Savior has come. God has become man, and the God-man has fought the battle, and he has conquered by the cross. You know, even death couldn't keep him captive. He rose triumphant from the grave, and Christ has. Notice the tense of the verb. He has won, and he brings that victory to all of us who are in him by faith. The good news is not that there's no hell below us and above us only sky. The good news is that though hell is real and terrible below us, Christ reigns from heaven on high and leads us who trust in him, in his glorious train to paradise. This is the gospel of God, which, verse 2, he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, in Genesis, Exodus, in Leviticus, in Psalms, in Proverbs, in Ecclesiastes, in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, in Habakkuk, in Zechariah. And Malachi. And yes, that same gospel that finds and meets us here in Romans. Dear flock, tola lege, tola lege, take up 